Let's see here. There we go. Okay, well, good afternoon or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world. Uh, this is Patrick Milliken from the Poison Pen Bookstore in Scottsdale, Arizona. And we're really excited to have with Richard Armitage with us this afternoon to discuss his new book, Geneva. And uh, just, you all know who he is, but I'll give a nice little uh, blurb here. Richard Armitage is a multi-award winning stage, screen, and voice actor, best known for his roles in Peter Jackson's trilogy of The Hobbit, uh, Captain America, The First Avenger, Alice Through the Looking Glass, Oceans 8, and most recently, The Stranger and Obsession on Netflix. And uh, Geneva is his first novel, and Richard lives in London and New York City. So uh, here's the book, Barbara, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Patrick's holding up our only copy. We blew through <laughs> all our signed books, but negotiating just now with Richard, there's a faint shot that we can get more signed books while he's back in New York from London. So if you're interested in one, hasten to our website and stick in your order and we'll see what we can do. Thank you, Richard, for agreeing to do that. That's very cool. Of course. Cool. So are also, you excited? Uh, it's selling well. I'm glad. No, it's delighted just doing it. So are you excited at being an author after all your fame as a presence in stage and screen? Yeah, I mean, it was a bit of a surprise. Um, the The story of the story began as an audio book. So um, it was it was a commission from Audible, who are, who are very good friends of mine, and I've read a, a lot of... Um, other authors and and crime thrillers for them so this was an offer I just couldn't refuse and uh, in a way it was a bit of a red rag to a ball because I just didn't know if I could do it so I, I I said yes and then figured out how. Well I understand from material in the book always read the acknowledgments but wait till the end that our old friend Harlan Coben gave you um, a push in this direction and you know, Car Harlan has gone from paperback originals to hardcover sensation to big television, you know, screen presence. So um, he would know the right things to say to you. Yeah, I mean, he is effectively my boss. <laughs> I've done three, um, I've done a Harlan Co Coben hat trick actually for Netflix. So we met back in 2019 and um, I was interviewing him at the beginning of this year for his latest release, I Will Find You. And actually, he jokingly said to me, you need to stay in your lane, Armitage, because this book was on its way out. But actually, he had been a bit of an unconscious mentor to me as I was writing. I didn't I didn't grill him too heavily, but I just listened. I do do a lot of listening. And, and I watched how he was in script meetings and I listened to his opinion about story and I obviously I've read a lot of his work so yeah he was an inspiration and I picked up some really interesting writing tips from him. I imagine did you learn anything from Peter Jackson? Yeah I mean uh, one of the things I really learned from Peter was his um, ability to look at all of the doors in a story that the author offers but doesn't necessarily go through them. And Harlan's the same, I think. He he sort of, he tickles down one pathway, but doesn't always go down it. Uh, whereas Peter obviously expanded of quite a, a small book into three movies, but he's just, a, they're just both great storytellers. And that's really how I come to this. It doesn't, it's not really changing lanes. It's all in the same wide lane of storytelling. Well, there are, there are certainly authors who write screenplays and increasingly there are a lot of screen screenwriters who are writing novels. Um, one of the advantages to writing a novel as opposed to a script is that you can do it all by yourself. Um, so there are, you know, screenwriters who talk about what a pleasure it is to be able to just, you know, like be the boss of their work and get feedback and all that good stuff. But it's a big deal. You know, a hundred page screenplay and a 300 and some page novel, there's a lot of material there to, you know, not everybody can do that well. Yeah, I mean, I suppose in a way, along my the road of my career, I have picked up a few tools. Um, I've in early seasons of Robin Hood, when and back in two thousand and seven, I finally plucked up the confidence to start talking to the showrunner about my character and tentatively suggesting some story ideas, and and uh, that was Dominic Mingella. Anthony's brother and uh, we really got along well and and over the years I've, I've gained more of a voice in those rooms 
Um, but I've seen I've seen successes and I've seen errors in storytelling. I, I think in season eight of Spooks, which is MI5 in America, we started a 10 episode series with one page, um, one, yeah, one scene. And I, I remember thinking planning is everything and getting all of your scripts together is everything. So one of the things I really did apply before I started writing this was setting out a really watertight outline before I even began to attempt to write the story. Well, you know, that's that's an interesting, it'll, it always comes up. Somebody always wants to know whether you're a plotter or a pantser, a term I love, <laughs> you get the idea. I that's think a new term I have learned. <laughs> it's the alliteration, I think, that's the reason they do it. But basically it means to write by the seat of your pants, i.e. without an outline, or are you a person who um, who outlines carefully? And, and, and they're really two schools quite different. Occasionally people make a transition from plotting to pantser, and more rarely, they make a transition from winging it to plotting it. Um, and those that wing it say that if they plot it, there are no surprises and they get bored and the reader will get bored and whatever. People who plot want some kind of a roadmap, you know, towards the finish. And that doesn't mean if you're a plotter that you can't surprise yourself along the way, but it does mean you have a destination. Yeah, when authors say to me, "Why well, didn't know who the you know who did it until the end or something," I go, <laughs> "Oops!" You know, I would find that extremely unnerving. But then I'm not an author, so that's just me. Yeah, I mean, I've only written one, so I don't know. I mean, I I have applied this a similar method to the second one that I've started working on, but I am um, I'm also a musician, so I have always understood that sense of form and in a way form is great when you when you know it because then you can break it and and one of the things that I'm enjoying the second time around and I know that my editor is going to get is going to be pulling her hair out is that I love having that structure and then getting to the the chapter and I've got a little prescription of what needs to happen and then just dropping something in that nobody expected so there's a bit of flying by the seat of the pants but within within little parameters you know Sometimes I get ahead of myself. Sort of like Beethoven, right? <laughs> <I'm not kidding. laughs> you know, I mean, I think I think that was the wonderful thing about Beethoven as a musician. You know, he understood, you know, the symphonic form or the, you know, concerto form or whatever it was. But then within that, you know, he took the classical tropes and he, you know, he broke them, blew them up, you know. And, yeah. and I think that's, I mean, he's such a transitional character in music. Um, yes. And you know, I'm I'm a very much an opera fan. So, you know, I have followed along from Donna. I don't know if you know Donna Leon's work at all, the wonderful commissary. Well, if you don't, I must introduce you to it. It's a it's a 20-some book series, and it starts with Death at La Fenice, the Venice Opera House. And the, uh -huh. the conductor is the is the victim in this book. Oh wow. Donna Donna is a tremendous opera fan, um, as am I. And we just did a, a Zoom event together. She's in Zurich, not not too far from Geneva, where this book takes place. And so we we talked about um, you know, inspiration and in musical form and how that, you know, relates to a novel. So there's a lot to learn. Yeah. I mean, I think you're right about that sonata form. It 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 really works for, it works for a three act play. It works for a for a book. You know, you, you with prologue and coda as well, and the, all of the sort of musical developments. It's it's not so dissimilar. Even a three and a half minute pop song, it's it's always going to follow some kind of structure that we feel comfortable with. Right. When when it comes to streaming, because I don't intend to go to the movie theater and immerse myself in screaming teenagers at my age, <laughs> but when I get to see Taylor Swift and the Eras Tour, I'll be really interested to see you know form and style and all those things, you know, because there is so much storytelling within her songs and you know personal narrative at all, and I'll be curious to see how it all goes together. So it'll be fun. Yeah. I meant to tell you that to amuse myself on one flight home from New Zealand, of which I've taken several, um, I watched the entire 
three Hobbit movies on Air New Zealand from the moment we left Auckland to the moment we got to Los Angeles, roughly. It takes that. And there was still time for the flight because that's a long flight. <laughs> well, you know what? People are always saying what a long flight it is. So let me tell you this. If you live in Phoenix, it's the same distance in flight time to Auckland as it is to London. But everybody thinks of New Zealand as like Japan, which I mean, sorry, like Australia, which is another three and a half hours. You know, but New Zealand really isn't that far if you're flying as compared to Paris from here or Rome from here or even London from here or Stockholm or all places that I go, you know, so it's all I love that you time. travel to New Zealand. Oh, I love New Zealand, especially the South Island. Actually, we have been um, deeply investigating what it would take to live in New Zealand should elections here not go the way we would like them to. And there's a two-year visa that we can get. We have to work out the um, quarantine for the puppies, but I think it's pretty easy. I think it's like 20 days or something. And you have to have various assets and all the rest of it. But I said to my husband, that the South Island, which I'd really love, would not be a place that we would want to spend the winter now that we've lived in Arizona since 1986. <laughs> we, would, we wouldn't even know what to do with it. So I think the North Island, I'm sort of interested in the Marlboro region. I've been to Napier in that area. I don't like Auckland much, but I do think that the Southeast part of the North Island is just gorgeous. Fabulous wine. Yes, exactly. So <laughs> I don't know. Worth it for that alone. Not take on a winery, but maybe find some sort of accommodation, you know, within one. Anyway, yeah, New Zealand is is great. And in the Sam Hewn, Graham McTavish thing that I mentioned, Clanlands, this time they're actually in New Zealand because that's where Graham is from. Sam is, is Scottish for yes. the Outlander thing, but but Graham is a New Zealander. Yeah. We we right, remain so friends. Yeah. Well, we digress. I also have been everywhere in Switzerland but Geneva. So we're oh, now, you have to go. You must go. Beautiful. Well, we're taking a um, a Christmas market cruise in December from Dusseldorf to Basel, but then we don't have time to go to Geneva. So instead, we're driving to Munich and then flying home. But at some point, I would like to get to Geneva. And there have been a couple of financial thrillers set in Geneva because it is a banking capital and so forth. Um, but in Richard's book, which we will now talk about, Promise, <laughs> Geneva, um, it's also a, a tech center. So, Richard, what was the inspiration for this book? Because it really does have an unusual plot. Yeah, I mean, I was plotting the story when we were coming to the end of the, the, the pandemic, and I'd been watching a huge amount of people on television sort of bumbling their way through misinformation. And there was a, a scientist in the UK called Sarah Gilbert, who was fronting the AstraZeneca vaccine program from Oxford. And her and a team of virologists actually came up with the vaccine about a year before it was released. But I was watching her talking a lot. Um, and she won the Rosalind Franklin Prize. And I just thought she'd be a brilliant basis for a character, somebody of such assured excellence and intellect to sort of put her at the center of something where she stops trusting her own mind and is at the center of a crime involving science and biotech. And that that was really the seed of the idea. And I picked Geneva for the reasons you said, actually, I really like this sort of secrecy of the, the financial world, also the cutting edge technology. And, and also I needed a kind of lair for the Institute, the Schiller Institute, which was at high altitude, somewhere very secretive. And I, those kind of things get me very excited. So Geneva seemed like a great place. And I had visited a few times. I, I ski a lot. So I used Geneva to sort of get to the Alps. So uh, it was thrilling. And I, I did actually at the end of writing, I did a, a little geographical research trip. Did you? Oh, yeah. Nice. Well, Geneva is, you know, an international airport, so as compared to, say, Basel, <laughs> so that makes <laughs> a certain amount of sense. Let's go back to Rosalind Franklin because she's such an interesting character. Um, I'm not sure everybody watching it would know her story, but I think it's a, I think it's a remarkable story, also kind of a sad one. Um, you want to tell it of Rosalind Franklin. Well, I don't know the story. I just know her prize. Ah, <laughs> I know the story. So and it yeah, applies to all this because Rosalind Franklin was a brilliant scientist and um, 
was shut down or shut out, I should say, by the male British scientific establishment who didn't think much of having a woman mucking around in the labs. And she spent time in France. And then she went back to England and worked with Watson and Crick. And it really is her research that more or less produced the double helix, but she got shut out of any uh, recognition for it by, I'm trying to remember which one of them was the real prick. Was it Watson or was it Crick? I think it was Watson. Let's who, say Crick, because you know, it could be Crick the prick. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds better. <laughs> it rhymes. Um, I, but Watson wrote the book. Watson wrote the double helix, so I tend to think it might have been. Him. Anyway, regardless, Rosalind Franklin does, d- did not get the recognition that was hers for the discovery of the double helix, which, of course, has led to astounding things in, in medicine and all. And I'm happy to hear that there actually is a Rosalind Franklin prize because yes. I think now over, you know, lapse of decades and so forth that she, I'm trying to remember, I think it's Jillian Cantor who wrote a great book about, but it may have been Marie Benedict. One of the other of them wrote a book um, about Rosalind Frank, a novel, but um, a biographical novel. Is that an oxymoron, do you think, a biographical novel? No, not at all. I think it's a yeah, it's a it's the sort of novel about the 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 person, right? It's novelizing the life. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, like actually, I think that fiction very often can get to the truth of a life more than um, a memoir or a formal biography. Authors being gifted with astonishing insights into character and all that yeah. kind of stuff. But anyway, um, I think she's a figure people should should read about. And if your novel inspires them to do that by saying she was sort of a Rosalind Franklin character, that would be a good thing, Richard. Well, I was, you know, what I was really interested in is um, as I was watching Sarah Gilbert receive her prize and giving a giving a talk that she. She had an ease about her and and she really w- didn't feel like somebody that wanted the limelight, even though she had this uh, track record of biological excellence. And, and actually, in my fictional version of, of Sarah, I'd, I'd awarded her the Nobel Prize, but she didn't turn up to receive it because, again, she was stepping back from the limelight. And actually, her achievements very much overshadow her husband who is desperate for acclaim and and living in her shadow. And I just thought that was an interesting tension inside a marriage because uh, one of the reasons why he persuades her to go to Geneva is because her presence there is going to elevate his career, which I thought would be an interesting dynamic. It is an interesting dynamic. Do you know there have been quite a few studies that show that women who are more successful financially or professionally than husbands, um, that it usually leads to such an imbalance in a marriage that, um, and women often get resentful if they, um, if the husband doesn't keep up, so to speak. So there's been, it's a power dynamic that has been explored. So I wasn't terribly surprised that Daniel and Sarah had difficulty managing it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I w- what I was interested in was seeing how he dealt with it, um, finding himself without giving too many spoilers away, plotting something that is theoretical at first, and then finding himself in a place that, you know, is is almost a point of no return, that he, deep down, there's sabotage looming in the foreground. Why, Why is Sarah so reluctant to be in the limelight? Why did she turn down the Nobel Prize? I mean, assume she's not like Bob Dylan, you know, it's just being our favorite word for tonight, a prick. <laughs> why Why would that have been true? I mean, this was part of her backstory and I felt that um, she she claimed that, that it wasn't her alone, that she was part of a team. And again, this all came from listening to Sarah Gilbert talk. Um, and I used quite a lot of her backstory because she was responsible for a lot of early successes with Ebola. Um, but, you know, as I say, very early on in, in the book, um, you know, when a when a virus contracts and disappears, so does the funding because people become disinterested. I mean, already we're, we've sort of moved on from from COVID. And so she I think it's that issuing fame because she's so focused on her work. And and I sort of I suppose in a way this, that I'm 
I put myself into that place as well. I, you know, the awards and the plaudits are wonderful, but actually it's the work that we all want to do. And, and she's very focused on work. She's also nurse, nursing her father who has early onset Alzheimer's. So family and, and uh, taking care of her father has taken a precedence over her career. You know, I am still in awe of the rapidity with, with which a vaccine was developed for COVID. I was barely in high school, maybe I was in high school actually, when Jonas Salk produced the first polio vaccine because polio was the scourge of my childhood in the 1940s. It was a, you know, a constant, mm -hmm. constant worry and there was no really coming back from it, at least not easily. In the same way that, you know, cancer was a death threat up until fairly recently, and now there are treatments so people can live with cancer, but that, that certainly wasn't the case. And so having, you know, witnessed how long it took for Salk to develop the vaccine. But then the other thing that I find so amazing is people fell on the Salk vaccine with glad cries, and, you know, we were all lined up in school to get it and all that. I just never have understood the anti-vax thing that went on with COVID, you know, you would have thought that everybody would have been delighted to have a chance to beat the disease, but. Yeah, I mean, I came away with some real gems from this, from, from following Sarah Gilbert. I mean, one of the things that um, really struck me is she said uh, in what, I think it was um, in an interview about the pandemic, she said, um, the minute the, the COVID uh, virus had been genetically uh, what's the word when you when you find the genetic code for the vaccine? She said we knew we had the the we had the vaccine a year ahead of its release. They knew in the first weekend, once they'd identified the virus, that they could do the they could have a vaccine. But it took so that reassurance from her was making me think they've got it. It's just going to take this much time to put it out there. The other thing that was really interesting that she talked about was all of the vaccinations that happen without us knowing it. The way that they vaccinate horses, for example, and other animals that we come in contact with to protect us. So it made me realize that vaccines are not necessarily about yourself, they're about protecting others. And also that very simple thing of, and again, this came from Sarah Gilbert ha having a question and answer session is that a vaccine stays in your body for the for 12 hours and no longer and, it, and all everything that's put into your body has left at your body by by the next morning. And it's just taught your body to to recognize it so all of these things were which were coming out of her mouth i was uh yeah i i, I got a lot of reassurance from her you know you I'm were so about right. no but you were so right about you know the the protecting the community it is an entirely selfish thing to forego it and then you know risk exposing well, there's been a lot of controversy here about people refusing the measles vaccine for example for children and other things so you know, it is, it's about, it is about community and about, you know, not endangering everybody. The other problem, of course, with the new vaccine um, was really demonstrated brilliantly with uh, the discovery of penicillin during the war is that you have to ramp up production. And that takes a long time. You know, even if you have the vaccine, it doesn't do any good. If you just have a small quantity yes. of it, you have to, you have to be able to, you know, produce it well enough or fast enough and large enough to you know to actually immunize the community yeah yeah but i mean she was the one person that i was listening to during that time so i think simply because of her past experience and her her extensive knowledge so yeah right. she doesn't know i've written this book <laughs> but, <laughs> well she will um, know. Somebody's down the the <laughs> I, I i'm i was I, in the future i will you know track I, actually at the time i was i was looking into getting the life rights to her to her story because I think um either a documentary or or a drama about her because I think she's she's been responsible for some quite remarkable achievements and so but anyway I, I put her in a crime story <laughs> well why not that's a memorial of a sort I love it so we have Sarah the Nobel Prize winning but ceremony shunning heroine here um married to Daniel who um they met in graduate school and I gather they were both very good, but Sarah was always better, more top-notch. Um, and so Daniel, Daniel wants her to come to Switzerland, to Geneva, for a conference, which will bolster his career. 
how come Sarah agrees to go? Well, I think he manages to persuade her because um, the actual the technology that they're um, investing in is a is a neural implant which is being touted as a as a therapy for various kinds of dementia. It's it's controversial. It's theoretical. But he does manage to convince her that this might be a breakthrough that that could be something that might help her father. Um, when she gets to Geneva, she receives a diagnosis that she's in the st early stages of um, an Alzheimer's diagnosis. And, and that really throws a cat amongst the pigeons because it makes her presence there. Uh, it seems that she might have an agenda and, and a journalist picks up on that. But it's really, I think, that balance of this could be for the, the greater good rather than a sort of financial incentive. So she goes out of curiosity and because her conscience is saying this could change people's lives. If I And if she puts her name behind it, if she believes in it, then it will get press attention and will probably move forward. So that is, in fact, the end goal of Daniel getting her there, in theory, is to have her name put on this so that um, it will make it it's sort of like getting a movie star's endorsement for something, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. I think how terribly cruel for somebody like Sarah to be facing a uh, a form of dementia, Alzheimer's, or whatever it might be. There's a, apparently a genetic component to Alzheimer's, so not unrealistic for her to, you know, to be showing signs of it. But so she really has an awful lot going on, doesn't she? You know, she has her career, she has her father, she has her own diagnosis, she has this strains in her marriage, there's a child involved, and then there's this journalist who keeps floating around the edges. And the journalist clearly has an agenda because you quote the journalist, don't you? Yes, yes. The, the journalist was um, was inspired by those kind of controversial bloggers or people that have television shows and they really revel in a kind of political disinformation. But in, in the case of Terry Landau, she... She is uh, out to, to sort of expose the hypocrisy of the pharmaceutical industry. and uh, But she's always been a bit of a fan of, of Sarah. So she, she sort of hones in on this event in Geneva, knowing that she's going to be there. So her, her target is to get a one-to-one -one interview with her, to pick her brains and, and find out what's really going on with this neural implant. So she's not really a mainstream journalist. She's a blogger, if I remember, or she is she a podcaster? Which is it? She well, in the book, she's uh, she's a, a, a blogger. But if we if we go further into a television series, we're, we're going to see her face. She's going to be a sort of Alex Jones figure. Ah, okay, yeah. right. So there are all these people with different agendas, and here we are in Geneva. So you must have had fun creating the Schiller Institute. I mean, you know, you have to build it from the ground up. How did you decide to design it? Well, I'm a bit of a fan of architecture. I I um, have used architects over the years for inspirations for characters. I'm a fan of Björk Engels, a lot of those Scandinavian uh architects norman foster's geodesic roof at the at the british museum mm -hmm. and I, I wanted to create the institute to be somewhere that was like a glass box suspended on this on the edge of a mountain where everything inside it everyone can see into everyone else's life and their office so there's no hiding and then uh, i decided to put a spy into the head of security at the schiller institute a man called pavel osinov um, who is basically overseeing and making sure that everything's running smoothly and there are no leaks, uh, because, of course, governments want to get their hands on this technology. Uh, so it was really fun. And I actually took a road trip and I found a potential site for um, for where I might build the Schiller Institute in my head. Uh, but it was great. I, I, I sort of wanted scale and I wanted it to feel um, incredibly futuristic. So that was really fun. So oh, climate in Switzerland must also must play into everything. I mean, after all, they're, you know, serious winter, lots of ice. Well, probably less ice today than we're used to thinking about. Um, <laughs> you know, I can remember arriving in, not Zermatt, where is it? Um, where the Matterhorn, which which is the, the Swiss town near the Matterhorn? 
It's Zermatt. Is it yeah. Zermatt? Okay. Yeah. We took the train from Montreux. It's a gorgeous train. Right. To yeah. Zermatt. We were getting ready to take the Glacier Express um, over to St. Moritz. Anyway, when we arrive in Zermatt, you know, they say to us that you hardly ever get to see the Matterhorn because the weather, you know, clouds on and on and on. And, um, and sure enough, it was totally invisible. But as we had to get up at some ridiculously early hour in order to catch the Glacier Express just for like 15 minutes in the early morning before there was the Matterhorn. It was magical. But I thought, how odd to live in a place where something as imposing as the Matterhorn could largely be invisible due to, you know, the weather. Yeah, and I like it because it sort of looks like a slightly crooked finger. It's a little bit like a hook, yep. which I just yeah. thought there's something kind of monumental about it, but a little bit ominous. So that setting was was great. But yeah, the altitude was something I was really into. I liked the idea of somewhere that was difficult to get to. And actually, when I took my road trip, I found um, a turnoff quite close to Chateau d'Eau, just outside of Stad. And the road was very steep and it went through this very, very tight tunnel, which I've used in the story. And then you emerged into this plateau, which was which was on the side of a cliff. And I thought, this is it. This is the place where the, the Institute would be built. And I, I sort of designed the whole of the the, the sort of end. And, and actually, it, it makes its way into the prologue um, because those um, those avalanche tunnels in Switzerland and, and uh, Austria and France are, are really fascinating because they're sort of they're not used as part of the road, but they're like a little escape route if there's an avalanche into the road. So lots of things can happen inside those unused tunnels. And I just thought that would be interesting. So Switzerland is perfect for this book, but if you're writing a new book, you're not necessarily going to place it back in Switzerland, are you? No, no. My, the second book is going to be um, a little bit closer to home. I'm setting it in my in a fictional version of my hometown in the Midlands in Leicestershire. Ah, okay. A British setting. Wow, so you have the writing bug. Now that you've done it, you, you know you're going to review it. <laughs> You know what? I finished um, the final draft of this and we were getting into proofreading and all of that thing. And then I recorded it and and then it went out. It was only ever going to be audio. It was never destined for print. Um, but I suddenly felt a bit bereft. Like I, I, my practice of writing, my my Sunday mornings of getting lost for a few hours in, in the story, I, I missed it. So I... I I gave it a respectable time and then I asked if I could write another one and they said, give us some story ideas. So, so I did. But yes, I, I, I think I have got the writing bug. That's interesting. An audio, audio book original that can become a story. There's another author I'm not at liberty to mention who has conceived doing that in partnership with another author because neither of their agents would actually let them do it together as a book because it could hurt their brand, but they can do an audio together. And then if it works, then they can turn it into a book. So it's kind of an interesting path to, yes. um, to publication, I think, is to start with an audio original, see where it goes. Do you find also that having been audio and you're having um, you know, to read it and so forth, did it change the rhythm of your sentences and the pacing when you turned it into a book? You know what, when I was writing it, I read everything aloud, every um, scene setting, all of the dialogue over and over and over, because I, I thought this is never gonna be seen, it's only ever gonna be heard. And I know that uh, from you know picking up scripts, um, Sometimes an, an unconscious rhyme will happen in a line of dialogue, which distorts the meaning. And you think, what did they say? i missed that because there was a, a little rhyme happened or, and I'm, and I'm sort of obsessed with the rhythm of speech and the way people cut each other off in the middle of a sentence, or they don't really say what they're, they're thinking. There's a subtext. Um, I'm a bit of an obsessive with Harold Pinter and David Mamet, that kind of dialogue firing. So I channeled all of that into, into the writing, not thinking it was ever going to be printed. Um, but, it, but it, you know, it does, there were a few minor adjustments that happened uh, in the studio recording, but also in proofreading for the, for the, um, for the print copy, just um, 
Yeah, really just tiny adjustments. Again, repetition, bouncing of words, that kind of thing. So, but it's something I love. I I, I always say, don't ever sit next to me on a long haul flight because I read aloud. Oh, Lord. Well, yeah, I'll avoid you. <laughs> for sure. But nonetheless, I would imagine that more than most authors, you can actually hear your story um, because of your training as an actor and, and as a musician. And that often really contributes to the pacing of the book, as well as the rhythm of the sentences. There's a new book out um, by, oh, Lord, Patrick, help me, because you can tell me on chat. It's by Tan something Ang. Um, anyway. It is the most gorgeous prose I have read in years. I mean, I'm just enthralled. And it involves Somerset Mom um, in Singapore and a chapter in his life. Um, and the end result is, as somebody said, never trust a writer because it ends up with a trial and so forth. But, but you know, I in, in crime fiction, the prose is a, is a huge plus, right? It's a huge asset. But um, thank you. It's called House of Doors by Tan Tuan Eng, E-N-G. I just can't recommend it enough. He's a Booker Prize winner. Um, and his vocabulary is stunning. I actually, really rare for me, I actually had to look up a couple of words. It was like, wow. Um, but, you know, pro styling is a plus in crime fiction, but it is not necessarily the overall, you know, determinant of how the book is receive some very successful authors of thrillers have a fairly work I won't mention any names here um have a fairly workman like prose uh which works fine you know it works fine for the thriller but um I did think that you know your writing had a certain elegance to it which I really enjoyed thank you I mean I did um I did have to be pulled back because I I'm a lover of of a triple adjective and um yes I understood that there is a there's a, a, a mechanism that needed to happen with crime thriller, but I, I've always felt this, even in the most commercial of television dramas that I've that I've been part of, there's always, always room for the tiniest hint of a poetic expression in the dialogue, um, because the poetry finds its way into the image very easily. But with dialogue, if it if it's simply information, it's it just has a a kind of plateau for me. I, I you know, I, I was raised with Shakespeare and and Jacobean and Chaucer, and you know, I I think the way that that Shakespeare and Chaucer invented vocabulary, uh, just also the positioning of words at the ends of sentences or the end of the end of uh, the verse line, which sort of punches something into the into the into the ear actually because I was writing for audio I did um I tried not to to hammer it too hard but I did observe that that brilliant technique of of, of poetic expression so you start as an audio book now we have a print book what are the odds that it's going to turn into um a film or a television production well funny you should say that oh well, it was it was sort of an obvious <laughs> third act here Richard come on <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, Sony Sony have optioned it, and we are in the very, very earliest stages of developing it into a potential six part TV series. Wonderful. Um, I think I think it's my, very filmable. You know, I mean, you know, the, the I mean, the landscape is is interesting. The story has a lot of drama. As an actor, um, you know, the expression. I mean, actors contribute not just the words, but their facial expressions and their movements and everything to, to the dialogue and all. So um, I'm trying to work out how you might feel watching somebody take your sentences, a different actor, or maybe you're going to star in it yourself. You'd have to be Daniel. Um, and how, you know, whatever the actor brings to it might change some of it for you. Do you think you're up for that? Yes. I mean, and one of the most exciting things, and I think, I think it's because I've been in the room with people like Harlan Coben, Dominic Mengele, I'm going to talk about as well, when, you know, Harlan is a perfect example. He gets very excited when the script writers come in and change his mind about something or show him something he's missed or offer him something he hadn't considered. 
he gets really excited and i'm i'm really looking forward to somebody challenging me and saying you missed this you should have gone down this road you need more characters this doesn't work have you thought about this i'm i can't wait to have that dialogue and uh yeah it's exciting to think that 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 it will because you know it's it's going to need uh engineering in a way that that makes it suitable for for television but it was interesting because it's some of the the q and a's i was reading a passage which is a scene early on when daniel is looking at himself in the bathroom mirror and there's a crack in the mirror and he sees it sort of splits his face into and he sees two versions of himself and he starts to kind of become fearful of sarah's future um trying not to give too much of the plot away but it's interesting because it's a page and a half of dialogue, but in in a television moment, it's three seconds of TV. Right. But I I like the idea that uh, in a way I dreamt this in in visual images and in cinematic terms. I I thought about it more than I actually wrote about it. I daydreamed about it, and then I finally wrote it down. So it's going to come back from that place and into a into the cinematic world, which I'm thrilled about. Wow, I love it. It's sort of like, you know, what's an urobos or whatever, you know, the, the yes. circle thing. Definitely so. So um, second book, you want to say anything more about it or shall we turn to comments from the audience or questions? Um, yeah, I'll tell you a little bit about it. It's, um, again, it came out of a real conversation that happened to me um, and is very, very loosely based on a real event that happened in our village when when I w was uh, 11 years old. And it is about a group of teenagers who are back in the, I've set it in the 90s, it would have been the 80s <laughs> from, from my life, but um, something awful happens amongst a, a group of school kids, which changes their lives and they, it distorts who they become as adults. And uh, uh, somebody goes to prison for a crime but it's the wrong person. And in the future or in the present day, uh, an expose is happening to find out who really who really committed the crime. So that's a that's a very loose and early way of talking about it. But it's going to be set in the Midlands and it's really about a group of teenagers. Definitely made for British television. I can just <laughs> I can see your dual career tracks just unrolling in front of me as this goes along. But you know what's important? What's really important, Richard, is how much fun you're having. Oh, I love it. I mean, it's I, one thing. I I think I was asked uh, the other day. You know, what's the one piece of advice you'd give to a writer? And my answer is, well, I've I've only done this once, but daydreaming is something that I've always done. Uh, I've. I used to feel terribly guilty about it, but now I don't. Good. I think that's a perfect note for which Patrick, <laughs> let us call you up. And while Patrick's emerging, he looked it up. And the Rosalind Franklin book I was thinking of is by Marie Benedict, and it's called Her Hidden Genius, out in the back. And if you're interested in following that thread, I really recommend that you, that you get it. Um, I thought it was a fascinating story. Okay, Patrick, anything from the audience? Oh, yeah, quite a few comments here. Um, okay. Starting with Stacy, she would like to know how many Toblerones were consumed during the creation of Geneva? <laughs> uh, and she said, uh, curiously, did you, Richard, reward yourself for milestones during the development process? Okay, with regard to Toblerones, <laughs> I ordered a massive Toblerone because you can, you can get them kind of personalized. Uh, so I had one personalized with the Geneva title as a way of announcing the, the the book. And inside this were about 12 different Toblerones. It wasn't one big one. It was lots of little ones. And I thought, I'm just going to give them out to my friends. They didn't get any of them. They all they all just slowly <laughs> disappeared while I was writing. So the answer is a lot of Toblerones were eaten. Um, but I also I, I put it in the story because... I don't know whether you, in Europe, any hotel you go into, there's always a Toblerone in the minibar and it's always about 12 euros. Like it's ridiculously expensive. So I, I just sort of wrote a little joke about that in, in Geneva. Sorry, what was the second half of the question? Uh, let's see here. She's asking about other kind of rewards that you give yourself, um, maybe for finishing the book or different points, milestones along the, the way. I'm partial to a glass of champagne on a on a on completion of a chapter. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, let's see here. 
just lots of really nice comments. And there are a number of teachers that are tuning in, which is great. Um, uh, Nagin Khan, she says, I'm a huge fan, love the book and a beautiful narration. I'm an English teacher and we're starting The Hobbit this week. Uh, our discussion days are called Thorin Thursdays. That's cool. Um, Very. Gosh, yeah, she says, could, could you give a shout out to the to the NUI seventh and ninth grade? Why not? Is that is that the teacher? The NUI seventh and ninth yeah, grade. Yeah, I've got to say, what's the what's the the, the teacher's name? Her name is Nagin N A G E E N Khan. Okay, Nagin Khan. I'm I'm going to say this to you directly because the reason I'm an actor is because when I was in school, my English teacher Mrs O'Leary read The Hobbit to us, and she was so such a brilliant reader. I can still remember her voice doing all of the characters. And then 40 years later, I find myself in New Zealand playing Thorin uh, in Peter Jackson's trilogy. And I always champion teachers because I had brilliant teachers. I, I had a brilliant history teacher and a brilliant English teacher and a brilliant music teacher. But that, the you know, when when children are read to and when they're, when they're told story in, in, a, in a really brilliant way, it changes your life, I think. And it certainly changed mine. So keep doing what you're doing. It's great. And let's see here. She also wonders, any chance of you playing Maxime de Winter in a Rebecca adaptation, even an audiobook? Oh, I'd love to. That's a brilliant character. Yes, that sounds great. There's um, a new edition of Rebecca. Um, all of a sudden, because the Gothic is making a big comeback. There's, which, yes, there's lots of them. There's lots there of There really them. are. But yeah. as a result, like people missing. who've never heard of Rebecca are oh, suddenly it's... coming alive to it. And um, I'm trying to remember, is it Hachette, Patrick, that's putting out some update on Rebecca, I think. Are they? I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, mm. Somebody is John, John Charles of our staff is alert to these kinds of things. And I think he's ordered them. But, you know, for, I have to admit, over the course of 34 years here of book selling in my fourth career, um, I've been astonished at how many people have never heard of Rebecca. So, you know, it's a seminal work, I think. And um, it would be so exciting to have a new, there have been two, haven't there? There was the original with Charles Lawton and Judith Anderson, and I can't remember who was Rebecca. And then there was another one, but I don't think there's been a third one. I think it's also on stage at the moment. I think there's a production coming into the West End on stage. Ah, that could be. That could All be right. good. Okay. Um, somebody who goes by the name Sweetie Cakes 99 uh, Seems like you're so busy with all the interviews and acting and books. What do you do in your downtime? Do you get any downtime? Uh, I am going to get some downtime um, at New Year. And guess what? I booked a trip to Zermatt. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to get up the mountain and I'm going to reenact the, the skiing uh, accident. <laughs> no, I'm not going to act, reenact the accident. Yeah, no, I'm a passionate skier. So so my downtime is uptime up a mountain. So yeah, that's, that's what I'm so funny that we talked about Zermatt. I love it. I so, isn't your stad down by uh, Mantra? It's sort of in the opposite direction. Um, Zermatt is up the Sion Valley, I think, um, and Stad is in the opposite direction. But I've never, I've never been to Zermatt. I've only ever, uh, I've really skied in Italy and France, Switzerland, not so much. So I'm really looking forward to it. But um, yeah, I, I'm going to take the book and I'm going to stand at the base of the of the Matterhorn and I'm going to take a selfie. <laughs> Let's see. Stacy wants to know: Would you ever consider writing an autobiography? Um, I really doubt it. Actually, I, I feel like if anything uh, about my life is worth reading, I think it's going to find its way into a, into fiction more than a bi autobiography. I don't think I've done anything significant to do that, but it's quite nice to 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 let your 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 uh, yourself bleed into the to the characters that you play well also it's a little early in the game right you know maybe maybe in a few years yeah maybe in a few years but probably probably not probably more likely to emerge as fiction yeah let's see here there are a lot of ladies that are commenting about the dulcet tones of your voice i gotta say <laughs> um let's see okay 
Speaking of multiple characters in an audiobook, how do you find the energy for the vocal gymnastics needed to perform so many different voices? I'm thinking specifically of David Copperfield. <laughs> oh, well, that took about 14 days to record. Um, and I made a lot of notes that I pinned to the wall because, yeah, Dickens has a talent for introducing a character for, for, for five seconds and then dispensing with them. But one of my favorite characters in, in Copperfield is, well, there's two actually. There was Mr. Creakle, who kind of sounded a little bit like this because his voice was kind of cr cracked and creakly. And then there was a, a very small hairdresser called Miss Moucher, who I gave a Liverpoolian accent to. So she was running around the shop, cutting David Copperfield's hair. So <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot of fun with those characters. But yeah, brilliant. I love Dickens. Absolutely love him. Well, you and Donna Leon, who is currently rereading David Copperfield, have a lot in common. I oh. really want you to get a copy of Death at La Fenice. You're going to love it. I will. Good recommendation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Libby would like to know, um, let's see, what was your inspiration for NeuroCell? Um, and to expound, what are your thoughts on these types of devices and their use in society? Well, my my inspiration for NeuroCell was NeuroLink. <laughs> <laughs> that Elon Musk has been developing. Uh, and I deliberately left it very, very close to that technology because I, at the time I started writing, it was a sort of buried somewhere on the internet. And actually, since the book's been released, uh, Elon Musk has started doing human trials on his neural implant, but I don't know any human that's going to volunteer to have Elon Musk's neural implant and put into their head. Uh, but I... I am always fascinated with science fiction that is very, very close to science fact. You know, who'd have thought in our childhood that we would be so kind of addicted to a smartphone and so easily, and it dominates our lives. It's the first thing you pick up in the morning and the last thing you put down at night. And I, I kind of hate myself for it. And mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, it's a matter of time that we're going to have microchips buried under our skin and, and, you know, I, I think we've leapt forward and we've accepted these technologies without really questioning it. So for me, that was a that was a good ingredient to a, to the story is because, you know, that governments are going to leap on this uh, technology to harvest data and to do all kinds of nefarious things. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. So, you know, if you travel, uh, for example, that they have now gone to facial recognition, um, yeah. when we just flew back from Quebec going into uh, the re-entry in Newark, you used to have to take your passport and scan it, put your fingerprints down the whole bit. Now they say, smile for the camera. It takes like yep. two seconds and off you go. But I mean, you have to be part of global re-entry so they actually have your face or, or you know, it wouldn't work. But I was sort of unnerved. Um, yeah. Actually, last time I flew to Lufthansa, I think it was to Frankfurt and on to Egypt, they didn't bother with tickets. They um, scanned you we're in LAX and you just walk up to the facial scan thing and that's it. You know? Yeah. Plus our puppies have microchips. So if our puppies have microchips. Yeah. Does your puppy have a passport microchipped under his, is that, is that an identification chip? It's an identification thing in case they run away or whatever it is, you know, they can, um, they can be found. Yeah, or yeah. if they're if they're kidnapped or whatever it is, you know. So I don't know why Elon Musk can't use himself as a guinea pig. I'd be all for that. Exactly. Go for it. Go yeah. for it, Elon. Absolutely. Let's see. Here's an interesting question. Um, let's see. As an introvert, how much of a struggle has this book tour been? Are you an introvert, really? I am a bit. Yes. Um, yeah, I think it's it's always a bit of a paradox as to why I became an actor in the first place. But I think I, uh, in the same way that I got lost in a book at four years old, I got lost in, to, in playing music. I get lost in character, which is nice. It's nice to sort of disappear and have an excursion from yourself. The book tour has been um, really enjoyable, actually. And I think because I really did write the book and I, I know every every word on the page. I know every corner of the book. It was quite easy to talk about, but also getting to talk to book lovers and authors um, was a real pleasure because I get to 
pick their brains as well and find out what they love about story. And all of this kind of conversation is really useful for me when I go back to my day job, which is uh, acting. I can I can just take some of those those little nuggets that I've that I've got from from listening to to some of the other authors. It's been amazing. I've I've loved every second of it. And then do you have to kind of go back to your hotel and just kind of like hang out by yourself and recharge and then come back out into the world? Yes. Yes, a little bit. I mean, I uh at the moment I'm I'm obviously writing the next one, but I'm also developing two other shows for television based on other authors. And one of those authors uh interviewed me at the end of the the UK book tour, CJ Tudor. So we had so much catching up to do because I've optioned her book. <laughs> And she's like, where is it? Where's this show? So um, yeah, I, I'm I'm kind of busy and but busy with lots of story, which is, you know, it's like soul food to me. Let's see, what else do we have here? Um, okay, here's a history teacher, and she would like to know what is your favorite historical time period, or do you have one? Oh, I really do. Gosh, it's it's sort of I can I have two. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. <laughs> so I've always been because of my father. Um, I was named Richard because I was born on the day that Richard the Third died. So, so the Wars of the Roses and the Plantagenets has always been really fascinating to me. But also, I would quite like to have been born or existed as a very rich person in the 1920s in London. I think that's a fascinating mm -hmm. period, um, and I love that world that Agatha Christie writes about but of course it's you'd, you'd need to be in the in in the upstairs rather than the downstairs but yeah this gosh I love history I absolutely love it let's see have you ever watched the Dorothy Sayers um television adaptations the original ones um Edward Petheridge did did the 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 Harriet Harriet Vane trilogy there are actually four but they only did three but I'm trying to remember Ian Carmichael who I thought was an amazing actor was Peter Wimsey in the original ones but 1920s London I mean he's you know the son of a duke it's all this money have you ever read those no I haven't they sound amazing oh Richard I'm, my intro treat I'm going to be your bookseller I really <laughs> am. you're going to have to email me so I can send you some it's really easy it's just Barbara at poisonedpen.com you can't go wrong right um but yeah this is wonderful listening to you Patrick and I are both we're both sitting here making up reading lists for you I know we are and have they ever been adapted for television yes no that's yes, what I'm saying that's Ian what you were saying, Michael yeah. was the early adaptations of course they're quite they're quite old by now but the Edwin Petheridge, they did it really nicely with um, a very 1930s feel and so forth. And he, they're so different. If you want to Google Ian Carmichael and then Edward Petheridge, you know, they're so different physically. Um, I think Petheridge was far more like Peter Whimsey. But then he was a silly ass, as Dorothy Sayers wrote about him um, <laughs> in, the, in the early books. And so maybe Carmichael suited him. Better. It's hard to imagine Petheridge being a silly ass. So, oh, that's so. amazing! I'll pop them on my reading list. Oh yeah, now everybody should read should read Dorothy Sayers. I mean, it's pretty essential. Let's see. Um, maybe just a couple of quick ones. Uh, this person says, "I'd like to ask, what is Richard's favorite character in the book? Does he relate more to Sarah or Daniel?" Oh. Um, I think I think my favorite character in the book might be Pavel Osinov. Uh, I actually wanted there was a, there was a bigger storyline for Pavel, but we had to we had to temper him a little bit because he he was becoming a little bit too much of a James Bond character. But I really enjoyed writing him because he's a bit ambiguous. He's he's enigmatic. You don't know whose side he's on, and I I really loved the scene where. Uh, Sarah gets to the Schiller Institute and steps outside and he's out there having a cigarette and they smoke together and it's just this just this un, unexpected moment where she finally sees him as a human being rather than a some sort of a machine but um, yeah I like him all right maybe one more here um, let's see Sue asks you have so many interests in life I'm curious to know who is your favorite painter or artist? She's a docent at the local art museum. 
Oh gosh. They're on the um, spot here tonight, aren't they? They are. I mean, can I, I can, I've art has played a lot of roles in uh, you know, William Blake came into one of the stories that I told the impressionists I I played Monet for a TV show so I get I got very close to the impressionist and Kaibot was one of the impressionists that really grabbed my attention but I've got to say the one that slightly takes my breath away is Edward Hopper and I live around the corner from his house so I uh yes I'm always I'm always very yeah I'm always very taken with Hopper's work why I just love his kind of observation of uh, the urban life. You know, I, 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 there's something quite lonely about his paintings. Nighthawks came, it was always something that sort of made me feel, I think maybe that's the thing about being an introvert is that he sort of makes loneliness okay. It's like, it's fine, it's not loneliness, it's just solitude. And I, I enjoy that side of his work and, uh, you know, his choice of colors and, uh, mm -hmm. Sam Shepard really tapped into that too, don't you think? Yeah. Playwright. Yeah. Interesting that you mentioned William Blake. Um, you don't hear people kind of make reference to his amazing artwork. I have a yes. volume of a lot of the, I think, the Songs of Innocence and Experience that are all with all of his paintings. And there was an amazing exhibition at the Royal Academy of Arts uh, quite recently, actually. I, I it, it was combined with Bacon. Uh, Blake and and then uh, another artist who I've I've forgotten, but I I went to I, I actually used some of that artwork for my character and obsession. I just thought you know his uh, his view on religion and uh, that kind of extreme expressionism. I just I, I often collect a few images for for characters, but and I, a character that I played in Spooks had a Blake tattooed on uh, you know on the, on his chest, so I. He did uh, uh, your reason, didn't he? Yes, your reason. Yeah. yeah, with the yeah, two, yeah. With the two little pointers kind of coming down. They're amazing. They're they're so brilliantly graphic. I, I love them. Right, um, Barbara. I guess that's probably it. There are some other questions, but you've answered a lot of these already. So, well, is there any any further? We have like two minutes left or okay. so. Yeah. There's a burning one sure. or two. Yeah, let's just check. Let me just switch back over to Facebook here. Ah, oh, here's a good one. Um, will Geneva be translated into other languages like Spanish? I'm from Mexico. I really hope so. I think at the moment we've got English and Hungarian. Uh, but as yet, I think, uh, yes, I'd love it to be, but uh, we'll have to wait for people to ask ask for it to be translated. I'm sure it will and be. Here's a moment when Patrick and I, in a book selling mode, should point out that we ship internationally every day because we are the Outlander bookstore and Diana and Outlander have fans all around the world. And so anyone who's looking for um, autographed copies of books in English, we can provide them, especially if Richard manages to sign a few more while he's in New York. I'm going to get them over to you, I promise. Well, I'll talk to, I'll talk to Simon & Schuster tomorrow morning early. Anyway, um, but that, we never say that, Patrick, do we? That we ship anywhere, but we do. We do, we do, yeah. There's one good last question um, from Dee Dee. And the question is, morning, Richard, if you had to choose one piece of your work to demonstrate your skills and talents, what would you choose? That's actually quite easy for me. Um, I would say it was John Proctor in The Crucible. Um, and the reason I say that is because it was the first time um, at drama school when I played a scene from the end of the play where I really understood why I why I was there and it kind of connected with me on a, on a level that I didn't expect. And then when I got to play the whole of the character, it was it was sort of life changing because again, it was one of those projects that I I said yes to and didn't know if I could do it. I didn't know if I was capable of that ascent. Um, and it was a 12 week run and the audience was was extraordinary. But uh, yeah, I would say that had the biggest impact on me. Well, thank you very much, Richard, for your candor and your charm and also for your wonderful book, Geneva, which Patrick, you can hold up again, right? Um, <laughs> it's been a fascinating conversation. So thank you very much.
Uh, let me wish everyone who's watching it a good evening. Also, there'll be a podcast available um, in another day or two. So um, you can listen to it or recommend people listen to it that uh, didn't have a chance to watch it. I'm not sure also that people watching this recognize that it's also, you know, those on YouTube will know it. You can actually watch all of our um, our broadcasts on your smart television if you go to the YouTube channel rather than the Facebook channel. So there we are. Right. All right, Richard. Thank you so much. Good night.